Welcome everyone to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. I am Josh Beiser, and we have another developer interview lined up tonight. We're going to be talking to a developer who is currently working on the Kickstarter for his current project, that is Humans Took My Neighbors, which is a spiritual sequel and inspiration from the game Zombies Ate My Neighbors. So please welcome to our discussion tonight, Carlos Garza. Hi. Hi, Carlos. It's great to have you on. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? I am doing all right. We are recording this right now in the midst of a snowstorm. And with everything happening, I didn't want to do things too much online as I was afraid we would have issues and stuff. But... It is great to have you on, and we'll be having our discussion here. And for those of you watching this record right now, thanks for tuning in. So, uh, to get things started with, since this is your first time on for one of these talks, could you talk a little bit about what your background is, and what is Humans Took My Neighbors? Yeah, well, uh, I started learning about uh, game development back in 2016. Uh, I didn't study any career aligned to game development. Uh, I studied languages and I'm an English teacher. Uh, I'm from Mexico, mm -hmm. so that's what I've been working on. Uh, but I always love uh, playing video games, uh, watching development uh, blogs, and following the, the developers that I admired. So back in 2016, I started to, to take some courses and on Udemy. And the courses helped me learn about Unity. That's the, the software that I decided to use. Uh, I chose Unity because I had always been uh, really curious. I wanted to learn about programming, not just uh, making games. And there, there's a lot of great software like ODOT or Game Maker Studio that is more like drag and drop and you can make uh, games uh, way quicker and in a great way. Uh, I don't think, it, I think I've been actually been toying with the idea to, to move to one of those because they seem to be really efficient at making games. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as long as you can create something, it doesn't matter the, the tools that you use. Nobody is going to be judging you like, oh, but it's in this engine or it's on that engine. I think what matters is the experience that you, that you bring. And about Humans Took My Neighbors, well, I started toying with the idea back in 2008. Well, since I started development, uh, Zombies Say My Neighbors is one of my favorite games. And as you know, uh, it never got a, like a proper sequel. It has an, an unofficial sequel yeah. that is called uh, uh, Sam, the sequel. There's also Ghoul Patrol, but that one is like derivative. It's not really a sequel. Mm -hmm. They just slapped on the, <laughs> the characters on top of it. And I, don't know, I wanted to create that game. Uh, I started thinking about the characters back in 2017. Mm -hmm. I doodled a couple of monsters, you know, the classic ones, vampires, uh, a skeleton, uh, a werewolf, and started thinking about what relationship they will have, uh, or what was, why would they be uh, fighting later on, uh, back in 2019, I finished, I had finished my second project, and I decided to are working on Humans to My Neighbors. Now that I had a, a name uh, and an idea, uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> when I started the game, uh, the original name was Humans Lynched My Neighbors. <laughs> but the, the, <laughs> the name was, a lot of people gave me a like backlash, like, hey, that, that's too, too mm -hmm. strong of a word. <laughs> I said, like, oh, I, I wasn't uh, like meaning something bad, but yeah, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Some people could get offended or, or feel that it's, I'm joking with an idea that is not a joke. And I was like, well, yeah. Okay, so I changed it to a way, way tamer word that is took. 
they just take their neighbors. <laughs> they didn't do anything bad to them. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I started on back in 2019 in June. I made a, like the first prototype took me like four months. And, and well, I've been working on it since. Mm-hmm. And I know, um, I think we uh, last spoke through email, I think this was like several months ago, that you mm-hmm. had a first Kickstarter that unfortunately I don't think it passed. And at the moment that we mm-hmm. are talking, you are currently running your second Kickstarter for the game. Yes. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> this is the, it's not the second, it's the, the third time I have run the Kickstarter. The first one was when I made the prototype back in 2019. I I developed the game for around four months. Uh, I have been working on the game uh, how, uh, part-time all the time. I, I hadn't, well, as I have a, a job, I had a job. Uh, I had to develop on my free time. And that first Kickstarter, I started it, but I basically I didn't have any media presence. I didn't have a... I had a Twitter, but I had maybe a hundred followers tops on my personal Twitter, mm-hmm. and yeah, it, it, it was just a, it failed. And last year, I was planning to launch on this date since last year, like on January twenty sixth. Mm-hmm. But I have a partner, uh, and well, he's uh, the composer of the music. We're not really like a it's not like a studio. Uh, I develop uh, everything by myself, but he uh, he's getting a commission for the project. And, and he was telling me like, for example, the, the first time I launched the Kickstarter was in October. And the second time uh, I was planning to launch uh, on this on January. But he said, hey, you're gonna miss out on, on Halloween to launch on Halloween and I said like I don't feel ready but okay let's give it a go maybe Halloween can help because it's a, the theme of the game you know spooky monsters uh, all kinds of pumpkins and shenanigans there and but when I launched uh, the reception wasn't that much it, it was just starting I, I gathered uh, some followers but on the it wasn't even the second week, and I decided to cancel. And I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead with my original plan. <laughs> and that, that caused uh, some friction between us. Like, he didn't like <laughs> that I canceled. He thought that maybe if I continue with all the, with the Kickstarter, like ran its course, uh, like suddenly we were going to turn things around, but I, I don't think that's how, how things work. Mm-hmm. So I decided to cancel and relaunch more prepared uh, this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's been uh, very tricky, I think, for a lot of new developers in the like, last three, four years in terms of going to Kickstarter. And I guess for people watching this right now or listening to us, what do you think was like the biggest, like I guess, change or addition to your third Kickstarter compare your previous two that you felt like was very important to kind of sell your game to people on? Right. Uh, I think, well, gameplay-wise, I think the biggest addition that I did was the, that I, as you know, the game is, uh, well, the, the game, the, the main objective of the game is to save the, the neighbors. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the previous build, that mechanic was set but for example the the neighbors were just like static there like uh, they were just like an item that you could pick so you had to walk to them and touch them and that's it they're safe and if an enemy hit them uh, they they died but i don't know i think uh, the game wasn't giving the wasn't conveying the idea that you had to save the neighbors Mm -hmm. like they were in danger so what i did uh, I was I worked on the past three months on the AI of the of the neighbors, mm-hmm. and I think that that makes the game feel more like alive. And I think that was was missing. Also, the the community behind it, 
I didn't have enough followers. And I think it's really important to have people supporting your project. And now, for example, when you, if you have a neighbor there, an enemy gets close to him, they start to panic and they run away, and you have to follow them or get rid of the enemies before you are able to save them. And I think it makes the gameplay more dynamic. Uh, it's more immersive. You, you really feel like you need to save them, not just like collect them like an item. And well, the community part is really important for a, especially for a Kickstarter. I I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and getting that community like up uh, or getting it solidified is very important for a lot of indie developers because you need to build that level of trust if you expect them to you know support you and obviously help you out with your Kickstarter. Yeah, it's true. Like have to be very transparent and, and show that you are working on the project, not just... Because I have seen some pages uh, that they have games. Um, occasionally they post um, like the same picture like every week or like a slight variation. Uh, I, don't know, I, I feel like they are not really showing what they are doing. I think it's important to share mm -hmm the things that you are working on, even if it's not... Well, I think it's important to to, to try to, to work in a matter that what you are doing every week of work is something that you can share and people can notice the work because lots of times, and that happened to me before, mm -hmm. you work on a game and the, you do a lot of internal work, like, okay, I'm going to change this code and I'm going to change like little in, internal details that, to be honest, if you post them, like, oh, let, look, I changed this coroutine to a, a switch, and people are going, oh, okay, like, you have to know that the work you do has to be marketable, mm -hmm. and not just something that you do. And it's really hard. It's easy if you have a person that is specifically working on, on the marketing side, that they can know, okay, this I can use, this I cannot use. As a, a solo developer, you have to be thinking, okay, I'm going to work this on this week, and of this week, these three or four things, I can share them, and people will like them, and follow them, and be interested in, in what, what I'm uh, showing them. Mm -hmm. Now, a quick question for you, Carl. So, when I always like to ask developers when... I see it from like kind of like outside of like kind of like the normal game development spaces in the world. What is kind of the game dev scene in Mexico right now? Are there any other like noble developers? Any other like studios in the area? Where uh, where I'm from, uh, unluckily there are no developers. I don't know anybody. There are there are a couple of software developers, uh, but. Just software like they they do, you know, some apps for the for the schools and stuff like that. It's nothing major, but there are some indie studios here in Mexico, uh, not in my area. But there's uh, one in Guadalajara. They made a they ran a Kickstarter last year. I supported it. It it was like a Metroidvania, but I don't remember the name. It, it looked like Castlevania. It, it it looks really good. It's about a girl with a halberd, and mm -hmm. it got a lot of of funding. And mm -hmm. also, they they got some composers for for Castlevania to work mm -hmm. on the game. So that was really interesting. Yeah, there are a couple of developers that are are doing uh, things that are uh, known outside of of Mexico. But not that many yet, I believe. All right. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting to see just like how much like we're seeing more developers kind of come up in areas that we wouldn't normally associate. One of my uh, earlier guests was a developer from Jamaica who was developing his first game. Mm -hmm. This was, I think, like a year, maybe two years ago. And really? I think it's it's getting better, but I, it's still I think is very hard to kind of startup especially if there's like no one around to provide advice and even just the general networking i'm in the east coast right now 
And the East Coast is not really as known for game development as much as the West Coast of the United States. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Uh, I think it's like areas, like some areas are, they are more used to use technology, others are more like, for example, here, uh, we have a lot of industry where I live, but I don't know, we, we tend to focus more on manufacturing and stuff like that. It's, I don't live in a small city. I think it's one of the biggest cities in Mexico. But uh, software development is something that is not common place here. Yeah. Or I don't know what reason. Like I, I suppose it's similar to, to what you are saying. Like just the, there's no scene and that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, getting back to the game. So obviously you mentioned uh, Zombies Ain't My Neighbors, Ghoul Patrol, both games I've played a lot in the past. I guess what inspired you to base them off, or base Humans with My Neighbors off of them? Oh, well, the, the most important thing was that I wanted to... I love that game, and I always was... I, I felt that there was a... Uh, some people, like, hammering for a, a sequel or something inspired by it so first i think there was a it was a, an opportunity because it's marketable like people wanted to see that uh, and also because i love that that game i i think i <laughs> all the games that i have made are kind of challenging and as you know <laughs> those games are hard especially mm -hmm. zombies in my neighborhood and uh, that that thing inspired me. Like I was like, okay, I'm gonna. I want to make a game that it's challenging, that you can play with a friend. Same like in Zombie Save My Neighbors, and you know, and also like I like horror and and monsters. So that was also a big inspiration. Like, okay, in what in, in what uh, kind of game can I use monsters? and make it interesting. And I was like, oh, well, something like, we say my neighbors, but if the protagonist is going to be a vampire, it's going to be weird, like he's killing other vampires. So I said, oh, well, let's use the humans. Uh, and I I use, uh, as I'm making the enemies, I'm using like all kinds of jobs as inspiration. Like if it's a mechanic, they use wrenches or a lady with a, a shopping bag hits you or stuff like that. Like, I think there's there's a lot of, of opportunity to make interesting enemies. I can use different professions or stuff like that. Inspiration. Mm -hmm. And for people listening to us right now, the on your Kickstarter, do you have a demo available for them to check out? Oh yes, yeah. I I made a. I had two, two demos. Um, at the start of the Kickstarter, I made one available for anyone to play. Uh, this is playable on PC, Mac, and Linux. And I made a special version that it was only available, well, it is only available for streamers. This version has three extra levels. But uh, I'm going to make it, it, this was only like a limited time thing. And starting next week, it's gonna be available for everyone, so we'll be a, able to try the full demo. That is six levels, including a like a boss fight, the first boss fight. Okay, I know I tried the game out. I think this was like three, four months ago, and the demo that we played unfortunately had some very weird bugs. Like it didn't want to reset, and things like that. I guess. With the version that you have now, like for people who checked it out back then, besides obviously bug fixes, anything new in terms of mm -hmm. gameplay, or you already mentioned you know six levels, but anything in terms of like the general gameplay that's been changed or altered since then? Mm -hmm. Well, the like I was telling you, the the biggest thing that I uh, changed was the AI for the civilians well, or the neighbors. How they react to enemies and they start to run away and that makes the gameplay more immersive because sometimes like they panic so they don't like i made the the running around random so they don't like they don't run top first I, I was thinking like oh they should run towards you because they need help 
I said, nah, that's going to make it too easy. So they run all around and you have to like follow them. That's the, that's the first thing that I think is, is different. Uh, also, I added a couple of items that make gameplay different. Uh, the healing is different. I made a world a little more interactive. Like you can read uh, cases, you can uh, read small comments about different items. Like if you walk towards a grave, and you can read it and they make a little comment. And for the enemies, I made a I think that the combat it's okay. It's like it was like a pinball combat, you know, like in Zelda 2D. Mm -hmm. You hit the enemy and it he flies away and then comes back at you and you swap him again. And that's still in. I made a little um, like an addition. Uh, now timing can be important. For example, if an enemy approaches you, you can attack them and they just can send them flying away and then attack them again but also you are rewarded in because enemies well only enemies with melee attacks they flash a little bit that means that they are preparing an attack and if you attack like when they release the attack you do like a counter attack mm. that makes them dc so that gives a little bit more of risk and reward like Get the risk of getting hit and getting uh, receiving a critical hit yourself if you don't time the attack right. You don't observe the the pattern. But uh, if you do, you get rewarded with uh, uh, an extra hit to the enemies or like that. So I think the combat is is a little more interesting because mm -hmm. you can approach it the traditional way, just attacking and that's it. You can even finish like. I have made some runs that I don't do any criticals, but I think uh, it adds like some depth that you can say, okay, I'm gonna do that. And obviously, that's only useful if you're fighting like against one enemy. If there's a swarm of enemies, like that's not gonna be <laughs> really helpful. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes the well the the gameplay choices that you make uh, are you have more choices now. You can decide how to fight. And, and yeah, basically that makes the combat more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that was in the version that I played with the ability to kind of like counter attack. And I did run mm -hmm. to issues. It's always been one of those challenges of action based games where if you can stun lock the enemy, it's always a case of trading blows. And in a game like this, when you have a limited health bar, you can't really mm -hmm. trade blows because you're going to just eventually die before you get more health. Yeah. And that way, for example, if you land a critical, well, avoid that. Uh, you hit them and you don't get hit, so that's that's a way to avoid trading blows. Mm -hmm. Because before, was only the only option you had was dodge the attack and attack them, attack them before they hit you. Mm -hmm. Now you have a, an extra option. Mm -hmm. And some people, well, I have seen some people stream the game, and some of them, uh, they haven't got gotten the, the hang of that like <laughs> they try to to play it like regularly and they struggle the same but i have seen a couple that start to to do that and then they reach the last level like like they struggle on one level and then oh it's like this and that's it <laughs> so yeah it's it's like you if you master it uh, it it can get easy maybe <laughs> depends <laughs> Now, I guess, uh, building off of that in terms of the gameplay, I guess anything that's been, like, majorly changed or something that you had to really alter in terms of the gameplay from, like, you know, your first demo to where the game is at now? First, the very first demo, well, the very first demo was really, like, a, like, proof of concept. But from this one, from the last one to this one, those are the... Additions I made, I think, well, I changed also something about the menus. Mm -hmm. uh, before it was just like a, like a pause, uh, basically, pausing, you could see the, just a static text, and I made it, now it's like a little book. You, if you press the inventory button, now you open a little book, and it looks like a, I haven't made the, the cover, but it's supposed to be the, the book of the, 
of the Monster Squad that are the the main characters. It's like their guidebook. I based it a little bit. Like I'm a really big fan of Majora's Mask, and if you remember, the Bombers they had a book like that that had the information about all the the citizens and stuff like that. And I plan to fill it up with all those things. Uh, now, like, I think the most important thing was uh, to make the game playable so they could see how it plays and just a small taste of of those inventories and how it's going to be more, make it more immersive because I think every every single detail adds to that experience. Yeah. I remember that having that notebook in Majora's Mask made it feel like you were actually taking notes about each person that you met and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, oh, also, well, sorry. <laughs> one more thing that I changed from the previous one is that well, the game is you is based on lives. Like you can have one life or two lives. Now, what you have to do, well, like it's supposed you're supposed to be playing with the monster squad. So for now, I have two playable characters. In total, they're gonna be four. Mm-hmm. But make the game more well, more conceptually cohesive you could say uh, mm-hmm. for example if you, you can choose one one of the players for example if you start with the vampire uh, he starts with a yo-yo and you start to get more yo-yos instead of the bat if you start with the the werewolf you start with the bat mm-hmm. you find more bats than yo-yos and if she that well if she gets defeated you don't get like oh it's second life and you revive again no you Lose your life and you get revived as the other member of the squad. And the dialogues change uh, if you're you change characters, even if you die in the middle of a of a level. And if you find that I added also a way like a potion that you can revive your character, but it revives the one that is previously is fallen. Yeah, you cannot get like oh I have. Uh, 20 lives. No, you, you just have the two players and you have to make sure to keep them alive or have a potion in case they die. And I think that makes, you know, it, it feels more like a, like a story of those two characters instead of, okay, I can revive the character as many times as I like or stuff like that. Yeah, but also I think it makes it a little like, easier in terms of a live system. So I know when I played it, I think like I die like very quickly and then it was basically just game over. At least in this case, you have the extra character to fall as a backup. And I guess uh, to build off of that for a second, are there have you given any consideration to multiplayer? Or is that kind of like out of your scope at the moment? Yes, it, it's it's basically the one, one of the most important things. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have like four levels already working on multiplayer, mm-hmm. but... I was having, I'm having problems with the, well, trouble with the mapping. Uh, as you know, uh, sometimes I, I haven't exact, like, that wasn't like my my most important thing that I had to focus on. So, for example, if you connect two controllers, that sometimes gets mixed up. I think I need to add, uh, or e- either make it myself or buy a plugin for control. And, and I said, okay, maybe I, I will add it in a... I, I plan to add it in the first alpha. Mm-hmm. In that in that alpha, you're going to have a taste of multiplayer because I think it's it's one of the things that I like most of. Mm-hmm. Said my neighbors. Yeah. And yeah, of course, it's it's the... I think it, it's almost my main focus. <laughs> I one thing that I think... To be honest, when, when the first thing I, I wanted to do, even before, now, I, I wasn't, I hadn't recalled, but now that you asked me this, I remember that I was thinking basically of making kind of like Left 4 Dead <laughs> or in 2D. Because mm-hmm. you know that there's like banter between the, the mm-hmm. characters, like when you're in the missions. That's what happens in multiplayer, like the dialogues, they interact like, hey, what do you think of this? And they, they say they have some banter depending on the characters that you select. I think that's gonna be a cool extra if you have somebody to to play with. All right, nice. And 
with the multiplayer, are you thinking about having it online or local? For now, uh, well, I have tested it only local. Mm -hmm. uh, I it might be online. Uh, depends of. For now, I'm only promising local multiplayer. But if I see that it's uh, possible to patch it up and make it uh, multiplayer uh, online, uh, depending of of the cost also, because you know you you need some servers. Uh, I think I will. I, I'm trying to make the work, the inside work, uh, be ready for a situation like that, uh, to, to be able to, to play online. But I think uh, for a small indie developer like me, it's, uh, it could gather uh, a lot of extra costs. And if it doesn't take off, it will be, it will be a lot of spending. So I, I think for now, local is it's the only thing that I have found. But if people find it later, and I see that it's going to be viable money-wise, I will do it, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we didn't mention yet, I just want to bring up, as well as the pixel art. Uh, did you do the pixel art yourself for the game, or do you have an artist? Oh, I, I, I do the pixel art. I like to... I'm a pic I consider myself a pixel artist and developer. Basically, for the game, I do the art, I design the levels, design the enemies. I make the well, I make the programming and that's, well, everything besides the music. That's the only thing. Like, <laughs> believe me, I I tried to learn uh, mm -hmm. to make some music, but <laughs> no, that I don't know. That that's like something from uh, another planet for me. <laughs> I'm watching the uh, GIF you have of like the melee combat on the Kickstarter. And I like like the little like mm -hmm. animation flourishes of like the character like dodging around the like the little stun she hit when she gets like hit like she like does like a little like dizzy spin for a second, and it looks it definitely looks a lot more like more complete than it was when I played it like several months ago. I added. Uh... A lot of visual uh, additions like i made a ton of animations i made the the dc ones uh, like i was working on the critical system i said mm, i don't think it like i was thinking okay you can make a critical hit and maybe it makes more damage no that's the the, the classic i said nah, i want to make it more interesting so i made it like if you critical hit them you get dc and i have to make all the animations <laughs> now for the dc like that that's something that sometimes mm, you have to be careful, like when you are making a game. You say, "Oh, I'm gonna add this," but when you start to work on it, <laughs> you you realize that you just gave yourself a, a bunch of of work. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, I guess with the gameplay, as we said, it's already it's based on zombies and my neighbors and so on. In terms of difficulty. What are you, I guess, like looking at in terms of how hard you want the game to be? Because, again, for people who didn't grow up, Zombies and My Neighbors could get very nasty, especially a few of those boss levels. If anyone remembers fighting, like, the giant baby as a casual player and having to deal with that guy. Yeah, that, that was... <laughs> I think Zombies and My Neighbors is... is it's, ba uh, it's definitely a, a product of its time. I, I don't think <laughs> it's a good idea to make a, a game as difficult as that. So I think the game uh, itself, it can get as difficult as that. But uh, if, you rem if you remember, Zombie Save My Neighbors was like 46 levels or 50 something. You have to, to like finish in one go and that's it. <laughs> like you didn't have a choice. And right now, what I'm doing is I'm gonna. It's gonna be hard, like it's gonna, but it's gonna be divided in sections, like of six levels each, and that way you have a checkpoint in the, in after six levels. But I don't want to make it too easy. Like after each level, you get, uh, you can do it again. No, no, not that easy. But so I, I try to make it difficult, but not that hard to to finish if you start to. Get good because you can have a good run and maybe in the first six levels, and then in the next level die, and you will be like, "Oh my god!" Again, <laughs> I know that that these days 
uh, there's some like for example in my case i i guess because uh i like to play those type of games i don't i don't mind like starting over i think it, like if i sometimes if i lose mm -hmm. and it's my fault it's like okay well uh, here we go again but i think I, i'm trying to to give a good balance of of that uh, making the game if you lose uh, to be fair not to be like Hey, why? Why did I die? Or like, I introduce new enemies slowly. I always make an introduction for each enemy. I have this character, uh, the skeleton, Bony. <laughs> he introduces you to different kinds of enemies. For example, when you start a level, there's a new enemy appearing. Mm -hmm. He will tell you like, "Hey, what's that?" And you, he goes to like he's a running gag. <laughs> Every time there's a new type of enemy. He points it out, he goes and he gets killed by the enemy. But then you see what's the danger, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and you can be prepared. And I try to make it like that. And now, no, maybe I will add a couple of enemies that are like way, way stronger, but I'm going to balance it out with the weapons that you can find. Uh, I, every enemy has a, an approach. As a matter of fact, I'm starting to share something on Twitter, and, it, and like every day, I'm gonna be sharing about an enemy and like the best way to defeat them. Because every every enemy has a, a way to defeat. Them. Okay. And how long are you planning on making the game? Like, what would be like the average playthrough? Mm, if from start to finish, I guess depends <laughs> how proficient you are. Uh, for a new player, like doesn't have doesn't know, it's just starting. I think it 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 could take about ten hours to finish <laughs> because of all the retries and stuff. But if if it was from start to finish, you are good. Uh, I guess you can finish it in around like each level six. I don't know, like in two hours. Okay. But you have to be good at the game and mm. Mm, don't die with the bosses <laughs> and stuff like that. Also, like every character has his own lines. It it adds playability, and also they have they find different weapons. I try to make th that. I like to to make a level crafted. You know, in roguelikes right now, like the over overall design is like the same. But it's randomized, like you can find, it, it's like thematic, you can see, oh, it's a dungeon, but every time the dungeon is different. And now you, you pass to another floor, and it's like a pyramid, another pyramid, every time is different. I try to make every level more memorable, because that's one thing that I liked about Zombies Save Whenever, like, oh, a pyramid, and oh, you're in the mall, and, and things like that. So I try to add replayability. If with collectibles that are secret, some unlockables. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a mode uh, for people that like a really really tough challenge that you are going to be able to play with Bony, that is the the skeleton. <laughs> He's gonna die in one hit, regardless of who hits them <laughs> or what happens. <laughs> and well, that that's just in case that a person is gonna <laughs> loves that kind of of challenge. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to think. If there's anything else like we haven't talked about? Any other aspects of the gameplay or design for the humans to my neighbors that we haven't touched on yet? The music can be. I think uh, that um, my partner in the music. He, his name is Karf Darko. He made music for the Film Theory, uh, the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I met him uh, when I was trying to learn chiptune music myself. Uh, that obviously didn't, <laughs> didn't go as planned. But I was trying to make some music. I went into onto Reddit and started to talk with people. I really recommend to any person that is starting in game development to, to reach out. Like always, if you, have a, if you don't know or you are lost in a topic, ask. Mm -hmm. Like there's always a person willing to help you. And that's how I met him. He helped me with the music for my first game. 
uh, baseball out. He made a music, uh, a song for my platoon for my the trailer of my game baseball out. And he he also is a, a big fan of Zombie Seven Manevers. He took inspiration from that, but like he's really passionate about making music and he plans to make music for each. Le every level is gonna have a different tune. That's how he wants to do it, and that's it. Like I practically, I, I don't have a say in that. I, I said, okay, that's what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. so I already shared like levels, so the music is kind of thematic. I think it fits the level really well because that's what he likes to do. Nice. And the and for those of you uh, listening to us or watching us recorded. There, there are links to some of his works on your Kickstarter. Yes, I have the to his channel, to his Bandcamp, and to the tune that I think is the most popular he has is that it's a is Face Shift is the the name of the tune. It's the one that he made for Film Theory. It's for a famous YouTuber. I don't remember his name. Is Matt? I, I don't remember. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, Starting this month, there was a little confusion because uh, Mr. Beast made a, a video, <laughs> and that video shared a, a MatPat is the name. He shared. He was talking about MatPat, and he said like, "Oh, these are all his channels." Mm -hmm. And one of his channels was Carf Darko, but Carf is not MatPat, and a lot of people were were. Like dropping in on his YouTube channel and saying, "Hey, are you MatPat? Do you make music MatPat and stuff like that?" It was like a weird confusion, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But there's there's some links to his music on his channels. All right, great. Yeah, and it sounds like the game has certainly come a long way, even in the last few months from when I when I first checked it out. So it's good to see that you are making improvements to it. I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, for people listening to us right now, what is kind of like the next big thing you're working on for the game? Oh, right. Uh, one thing, like I was telling you that each, each uh, character has, like for example, if you start with Fenrira, you will find more bats. Like Each character has their signature weapon. Uh, what I'm planning on doing is Trying to make them, uh, I wanted to have this for this demo, but I said, eh, with, with the gameplay, the base is, is good, and the next parts are going to be extra. So I think the mechanics now are set. So the only thing I'm going to do is expand them. For example, Henrietta, the werewolf, she uses a, a bat. So if you are using her and you have a bat equipped, we'll be able to make a couple of special attacks but if you lose her and you are with the vampire or the other characters, you lose the special attacks. Like for example, each one will have their special attack, but only with the weapon that they they can use that, that they are proficient with. That uh, next part, uh, it's already set in the background, but like the suppose well, the game takes. It's counting how many neighbors you save, mm -hmm. and depending of how many neighbors you save is how the game will progress uh, each six levels. So if you lose, for example, if you if you reach the end of the sixth level, you lost a, a bunch of uh, neighbors. Level the next levels are gonna be different, and if all the neighbors. Basically, it's like branching paths, but it's depending of your own performance, not of like choices. Like, oh, well, you can you can make a choice of not saving anyone. <laughs> but but the, the point is to, depending on your performance, that's how it's going to be. And the, the bad path is going to be a little more, it's going to be easier because I'm planning of doing some, some things with the, with the monsters, as they are monsters. Uh, are gonna have when they if you go to that path, will stop using items and the monster will start attacking with their own monster powers. 
I think that that to make it like a little more dramatic. The game is more like comedy, but I think it, it's it's a good idea to add like a little bit of seriousness now and then. Not that much, right? Like that's not my objective, but just a little bit. All right. And for people listening to us, uh, as we said, we are recording this in the middle of your Kickstarter. If things go well and you are able to get the funding and things are going to continue development, I guess you have an estimated release date for the game. Yeah, I have it for June of next year. Uh, when, the, like, obviously this month I'm, I'm trying to work a little bit on the game, but when you're running a Kickstarter, it's a good idea to, to yeah. focus on, on that. And mm -hmm. basically the, the development is going super slow this month. When the Kickstarter ends, I'm gonna if I get the funding, I'm gonna start working on the game. And I, as I want to make, I have all the levels already set. I, I, but you know that even if you have all the planning made, the the doing all the graphics and stuff mm -hmm. takes a lot of time. Yeah. So on twenty second, it's is of twenty. Sorry, of the year 2022. That's where I plan to launch. Mm -hmm. If the game will, will get done before, I will make an announcement and try to add some extras in, in that time. Uh, like I have a, a couple of extras planned, but I want to, like, one of my inspirations is Enter the Dungeon. Mm -hmm. And you know that they, they supported their game. Uh, for me, they are like. Mm, and the biggest role model like I can find, like how to make a, a great game. They they made their game, they fixed with every patch, whatever things that people found. They added more content for free. Yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah, they are incredible. And that's what I would like to do with this game. Like I keep supporting it for at least a year or a year and a half more or or depends. I even have, we're planning to make like a little versus thing, but that will mm -hmm. be like later. Like extra. Little extra. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I'm trying to think if there's any other questions I have for you. I guess anything uh, on your side that you'd like to bring up that we haven't yet? Hmm. Yeah, basically. Um, well, uh, the support that I have right now, uh, it has been completely from my followers and from Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, uh, I haven't shared this. I'm a little bit like, how could you say? Mm, how could I say it? Like reserved? Uh, like I don't like, like it's, it's kind of weird, but like I don't like to share things with my family. That's kind of strange. I do like to share with strangers on Twitter, <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's a little weird, right? Uh, like for example, all my family, they don't even know that I'm running a Kickstarter, and tomorrow I plan to share it with all the people that I know uh, personally, share it on my personal social networks. I think it's going to get a, an interesting spike. Why did I do this? Because I wanted to be able to launch on my own, I think it's important to have a strong launch, but I think it's also important to be to have a way to leverage that plateau that you have in the middle of a Kickstarter. And I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to share with my family uh, on the second week, at the start of the second week. And that will give it another push. I can keep working and obviously be working on my end. I'm not going to be like expecting all the support, but I think that my give it a, a little extra momentum and I don't know, I think it will set it in the right direction. Great. So I guess my final question for you then is, do you have anything you'd like to say to the fans or your supporters watching to end this cast on? Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much for supporting my game. I know that it's difficult sometimes to trust uh, a person with, with what they are working, but I try to be very transparent. I try to show you what I'm doing. 
I'm very active on the social networks that I use, especially on the one of my game, because I believe that being clear and work and showing the work that you are doing is really important uh, to to create that trust. And it's something that I I, I have backed a, lo a lot of Kickstarters, and I know that it, that's one thing that is really important for me, and that's the same thing that I want to offer everybody that that is helping me with this project. It's the same transparency and the same trust. Uh, they can see that I'm serious about this project. It's not something that I just came up uh, like yesterday and say like, oh, I think a Kickstarter will be okay. Uh, no, I, I have been working on this game for more than a year and I have been planning on it. I, I've been learning things, I listen to feedback. I try to improve everything. Uh, people tell me that it's not okay. Uh, I'm not set on my ways. Like a lot of people have, like, uh, oh, I think it's okay, and that's it. If people, if a lot of people have complaints, or even if one person has complaints, and it's valid, I I will listen to it. I don't think it. I'm not uh, beyond that. I I think it's the best way to create a, a great product is to listen to to the people that are really interested in. So that's what I want to, to do myself. All right. Sounds good. So with that, we will wrap things up for our discussion. Carlos, it was a pleasure hanging out with you today. And definitely best of luck with the Kickstarter. It definitely seems like it's come a long way, even in the last few months since I checked out the previous version of it. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure for me too talking with you. And sharing my project. All right. So, uh, for those of you watching us, we're going to end our discussion here. Thank you so much for watching the recorded version. If you are a developer working on an upcoming game and would like to talk about it or just talk game design, we are always looking for guests for these uh, podcasts, whether they're done recorded or live. And we're always having to check out indie games on the Game Wisdom channel. I think with that, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at GWBicer. There should be links to our Discord and Patreon in the description for those of you watching this on YouTube. Uh, for yourself, Carlos, any social media you would like to plug or mention now? Oh, yes. You can follow me on my Twitter. That is at HumansTook. That's a, the Twitter I use for, my, for the game. Also, my personal account, but it's linked there, so you can reach it from there if you're interested in that. Uh, well, I would prefer that you follow me on my game account. The other one is I punch, uh, I post different things like art, and if that's what you're looking for, that you can follow me there too. Awesome. So with that said, we're going to wrap things up for this week's discussion. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's on the art and science of games. Until next time, everybody, take care. <laughs>